this panel is entitled, How Do We Defend Ourselves Against the Cyber Warriors of the Future? So in your programs, it listed uh, Lieutenant General Bob Schmidl as the moderator, but he was unable to join us today. So Peter Singer, our colleague, is going to play the role of both moderator and panelist. Uh, so I'll introduce Peter. Peter is um, recently hired as a professor of practice at Arizona State University, also a strategist and senior fellow at New America. He's been named by the Smithsonian as one of the nation's 100 leading innovators, by Defense News as one of the 100 most influential people uh, regarding defense issues, and by foreign policy, he's on the 100 global thinkers list. Uh, he is the author of many books that, that, that you may know, Corporate Warriors, The Rise of the Privatized Military Industry, Children at War, Wired for War, the Robotics Revolution and Conflict in the 21st Century, Cybersecurity and Cyber War, What Everyone Needs to Know, as well as Ghost Fleet, which is a novel. And most recently, his book, Like War, which deals with social media and its relationship to war and armed conflict. Thanks so much. So thank you, Dan, uh, for the um, <coughs> kind introduction and also putting me in this, this kind of awkward role. We were joking earlier, it's a little bit like uh, trying to be a um, lawyer and uh, representing yourself, uh, and, or, you know, and so uh, not a great decision to do, but we're going to work with it. Fortunately, we've got some fantastic panelists to join me up here uh, with a really great array of experiences. Um, just the quick highlights, we've got Lieutenant Colonel uh, Natalie Veneta, who um, National Cyber Protection Team leader with the U.S. Army, Deputy Chief of Research, uh, Army Cyber Institute. And then the particular issue that I think applies here is Technical Director to Joint Task Force Ares, which if you're not familiar with it, was the anti-ISIS uh, operation online. And then we've got Donald Bray, uh, Director of Cyber Initiatives at Global Training Solutions with Raytheon, Colonel, uh, U.S. Army retired. And again, I think one of the most relevant highlights is that he was the first commander of the U.S. Army's Cyber Protection Brigade. So I'd like to kick us off with a question. Um, what's changing in the threat landscape? What will be the same? What will be different when you're looking at cyber threats moving out to the year 2030. And um, we're just going to go far side. So we'll start with you, Carmen. Excellent. So what's changing, I think, as many people have already talked about today, is this growth of a constellation of technologies, whether that's IoT, artificial intelligence, smart cities, robotics. Our research shows us that the attack plane is just going to widen. And in fact, I think the conversation by 2030 is not necessarily going to be, well, red versus blue attacker versus defender, it's going to be about all the gray space, the gray space that neither of them owns and that neither and that both need to be able to be successful. And we're going to be talking about the battles that are fought and won in that gray space. But I think what's most important for us to consider is not what's going to change, but what's going to stay the same. And that is that the user or the human will remain our greatest vulnerability, right? And I will say that is each and every one of our faults. And I mean that from a scientist and a researcher perspective. Those of us that develop the next generation, that next cool piece of software, or that next amazing hardware that's going to change the world, that race to be first to market, to get the credit for doing that really cool thing and changing the world. And we design for efficiency and effectiveness. And then when that gets misused or that gets changed by our attackers, we blame the user. That user behavior, how dare they? They shouldn't do that. If they just didn't do that, if they just didn't plug that in, if they just didn't click on that link, it would have been OK. It is the user's fault. And that is our problem, because we're not designing with the human at the heart of technology. And that's what we must start to do. Because if we continue to do that, at best, we are irresponsible. But at worst, this is truly a flagrant foul, and we should be red carded for our dangerous activities. I absolutely agree with Natalie. Uh, first, let me address what's not going to change. So cyber criminal activity will remain the same, obviously. As long as there's a material gain, a monetary gain, we'll continue to see nefarious activities on the network. Additionally, I don't see any change in the theft of intellectual property any, anytime soon. Our adversaries see intellectual property as a way to circumvent years of research and development, as well as investments so they can level the playing field or even leap, leap ahead in terms of technology. Where I see significant changes coming forward is really our tax in the cloud. Uh, we're leveraging the cloud more and more and moving more of our resources to the cloud. 
and cyber attacks tend to migrate to the most lucrative targets. And so I can see that cloud security would be even more important coming in the near future and, and thereafter. Additionally, I can see more attacks at the edge on our Internet of Things devices, which are growing at um, a, a huge rate in uh, national levels, on private level and commercial level. And so they'll attack these devices, Internet of Things devices, as well as mobile. I can see it being standard in 10 years for our mobile devices to come with antivirus and intrusion detection systems as part of their basic software package loads to ensure that um, we can protect all our information, whereas it's tethered or mobile in the future. So I'd add to that, um, in terms of what's staying the same is uh, the threat being hybrid, uh, a word that's gotten a lot of um, uh, use. And we've talked about it in terms of state and non-state actors coming together. So if you think about uh, Russian um, operation, Russian government-sponsored operations, but utilizing criminal networks, or the flip side would be uh, North Korea state actors going after private networks. But I think we're all, in moving forward, we're going to see more hybridization in um, different forms. So there's um, hybridization in terms of what we saw uh, starting in 2016 election, but moving forward, um, the combination of classic, uh, this is a space where you can say classic oddly now, or traditional cybersecurity threats, uh, hacking into a network versus what I call the like war side, hacking the people on the network. So if you think about what made the operations in 2016 targeting the US election, it was breaking in, stealing email, uh, but then it was distributing the information. So more hybridization of that type. Another um, increase of hybridization, and you touched on this with the IoT, as the internet becomes uh, more and more about communication between devices rather than communication between people, we will see more hybridization of digital and kinetic Stuxnet style attacks. So I'm not merely stealing information from IoT, I'm using it to cause physical change in the world, physical damage, shutdowns, and the like. Um, and I uh, but the final area uh, that we haven't seen a lot of, but I think we're going to see more, is the hybridization of what is real and what is fake. Um, this, of course, has gotten a lot of discussion around artificial intelligence and the idea of deep fakes using AI to create hyper-realistic imagery that it's hard for people to figure out. So I think we're going to see more of those style attacks moving forward. We've already seen little proto versions of it going after, for example, um, uh, activists, uh, gun control activists, um, and the like. I think we'll see more kind of use in war. Uh, another way of putting it is I was part of a, doing an interview recently of a, a fun little project of how would you take down a major American city using cyber means. And there was, you know, the, the idea of infrastructure, power grid, but it was also we were tossing in ideas of um, you would uh, have a prominent celebrity's Twitter account get hacked, and then they would distribute false imagery of something going on in that city, and it would cause much the same effect. So you don't even have to conduct the hack if you created the, the terrorism side of it. So um, let's move on to the next question. Uh, if that is in terms of the threat environment, how will our defenses, how will our own organizations evolve between now and then? And you can think about that as everything from um, what will Cyber Command look like in 2030 to how will businesses organize themselves in different ways in 2030? You can go first, sir. Sure, I'll start there. So um, in terms of evolution, I see that um, from a defensive perspective, uh, we have a vulnerability approach uh, in terms of the way we defend the network today. I can see us evolve into a more threat-focused approach. You kind of need both. But I can see the weight being more towards the threat focus. For example, if the problem is protecting auto theft, a vulnerability approach to that may be installing cameras, which we would call a mitigation, or going to make sure that all the doors are locked, which would be a fix. But if you take a threat-focused approach to the same problem, then you will learn all aspects of car theft, right? You will learn uh, who are the thieves, what are the motives, what are they doing with the cars, and most importantly, what are the TTPs they're using, what techniques are they using. If you take that approach, then you'll be able to align the appropriate mitigation and actions to be the most effective in the environment. Organizationally, I can see us moving towards 
more purpose-built cyber teams. Largely today, our cybersecurity workforce is trained individually on skills and then grouped together to apply against a particular mission. I can see more of that training being hands-on and an organization to have purpose-built, organized cyber teams um, based on the different threat areas we're trying to focus Can I on. follow up? Will we have the workforce in 2030 in terms of both just bodies? We know we have a, a labor gap in the field. Um, some put it, uh, you know, moving forward to over a million. Mm -hmm. And will we have the skill set to have those kind of teams come together? We have to work on the skill set, and we have a significant number of uh, activities going on that's going to help in that arena. There is a predicted cybersecurity workforce shortfall, I think some of which can be closed with AI, some of it can also be closed by getting more females participant in that particular career field. And I think both of those efforts are growing and will help us get there. Uh, as time progresses and we learn how to provide more realistic as well as innovative training, I think we'll be able to bring and increase that number of the workforce and close the gap pretty rapidly. Okay. So how to predict what Cyber Command will look like in 2030, or I'll say any, any military organization. And mm. I would say, well, as terrain changes, and as we already talked about, this threat landscape is going to change, then the terrain we operate on is going to change. So therefore, the organization has to change with it and the skill sets that we need. Looking for agile, adaptive folks um, to be part of the, the, the mix. But it's really going to come down to partnership. Um, Cyber Command doesn't do what it does all alone and unafraid on a network. Like, we don't own any networks. Let's start there, right? So it's always been about the partnership. And I think you'll see over the next decade is making stronger and smart, stronger partnerships, not only across the military and DOD, but across all of it, uh, the whole of government approach and with partnerships with public and private industry, because that's the only way that it's going to work. Um, I will say it's, it's got the hard mission of trying to figure out from an HR perspective, as we briefly alluded to the, the training or workforce shortfall is finding that right person in the right place, in the right work role, to be applied at the appropriate time, so that way we can achieve mission success. And I think that's something we struggle not only in DOD, but in the larger, uh, larger society is trying to figure that out in this space. So I'll add in um, two things. Uh, one is an organization that I hope we would have, but we don't have right now, but that I'd hope we'd have in 2030, um, is the idea of a civilian cybersecurity corps. Uh, essentially, um, we have active duty, we have reserves, we have private sector, we don't have anything in the middle. Uh, the way we do in other domains, for example, in the maritime domain, we have the um, Coast Guard Auxiliary. In the uh, air domain, we have the Civil Air Patrol entities that are ways to pull in civilians to help out in everything from training, war gaming, emergency response, you name it. And I use these examples showing how we have the legal structure to do it in the United States. We just haven't created something like that in cybersecurity. Estonia has a version of this called the um, Cyber Defense League. I'd love us to have something like that, which would be a way of going after some of these gaps. Um, uh, to be a little bit more provocative, um, in 2030, I would much rather us have a cyber force as a new service than the absurdity of a space force. Um, if you're thinking about as an entire new service, if you're going to create one that um, builds on everything from having a unique um, role, operational mission, very different culture, why would you do a space version before you would do a cyber version, given that the cyber one's already operational? So I'd rather us be having a debate on that um, uh, rather than uh, Space Force. That's me saying it so that you're not put in a awkward Thank you. Position. I, I appreciate that one. But to pull on that thread for a second about, you know, it's the civilian workforce coming in. Like, I think one of the most difficult things we have as a military advice uh, in the business world is that I recruit kids that are 18. That's what I'm looking for. And if someone decides instead to start their life out in industry and does amazing things, and then they want to give back to their country, and they just want to come on sabbatical for a couple years, but they're 35, I say, no, thank you. You might be the world's genius, but you can't join me. 
because your age matters. And I think if we could somehow relook the talent management perspective and the HR perspective to allow people to come in and out of the military, right? So maybe you're 18 and you want to join the military and we'll give you some training, you'll learn some skills, and then you want to go out in industry or you want to go to academia, but you want to come back in, there should be a path to let you back in. I mean, all for joining the National Guard and Reserves, and that's an amazing decision, and those are very important aspects uh, of the military, but I want to bring you back on active duty for a few years and where can, how can I bring you back in the structure and allow you to come in and out uh, and not have this traditional, you have to come in at 18 or 21 and you will serve 20 years and then you can retire and then you can have your second career. How do we change it so that you can come in and out and have multiple careers along the same path? And, and what I hope for is a mechanism that's not just measured in years. How you're, it's that I need people for three weeks because city government of Atlanta is under a ransomware attack. So I don't need them to join the army for a year. I just need that skill set for three weeks, people to volunteer, yeah. um, but you know, uh, our security vetted and the like. Th this actually leads to, and I'm gonna, because this is in your space completely, okay. um, in terms of your professional role, how do we, what is, what is the type of training needs right now for this scenario of 2030? What, that 18 year old, what should they be trained up on so that they are the best cyber warrior for the United States circa 2030? So there's a number of skill sets, but first let's talk about the training environment. So when I joined the Army 35 years ago, I was required to take individual marksmanship skill training. So I learned my individual weapons, then I went to the range and qualified annually. So we need something similar to that in cyber, right? We have to have an environment where the cyber professionals and workforce in and outside of DOD can train on their particular skills. Now, DOD is making efforts in that space in terms of developing a persistent cyber training environment, uh, which should be in its initial operating capabilities in the next 12 months, right? But we need to expand it beyond that, right? We have to have a realistic place for that workforce to train. From skill sets, uh, we absolutely have to be able to move from just situational awareness to striving to situation understanding. We have to understand the environment, so we need skills that help us do that in terms of data analytics, and we also need software development, agile software developers, as well as cyber analysts who can look at malware analysis, packet analysis, network analysis, threat analysis. All of those help you understand your environment, and only then can you take appropriate action. You can take action in the absence of that, but it wouldn't be as effective as you truly understood the landscape. So absolutely, yes and. Um, so I was working in a recent problem space on a problem, and I almost had to go back to my middle school skills. And by that I mean I first learned computer programming learning Fortran and Cobalt in middle school. And I won't say the system that I was operating on to do a hunt actually had those on it, but it was darn close. And what I realized at that point is there's no way to figure out what I need to train someone in 2030 to be able to do, because each and every mission I go on today is let alone a completely different skill set, a different technology, a different language, a different something on it. So to have this checklist of 5,000 things everyone needs to be good at for the next mission to be prepared is never gonna happen. So I would say what is important is having a workforce with a strong educational foundation so that they can be able to adapt, to find people that are inquisitive and to cherish that inquisitiveness, to look for creative and critical thinking and problem solvers, the folks that see a challenge and jump for it, and that are continuous learners. Continuous training is very important, but that are continuous learners along the way. And I say that is what the workforce has got to be for us to be able to get to what this panel is talking about. How do we defeat our cyber adversaries in the year 2030? And this is not a new thing, right? So if we think back in history, uh, Poland in the interwar period was stuck between a rock and a hard place of two countries that they were not going to be able to go toe to toe against from an, a military perspective. They had to outthink their adversary. So when Enigma was there is the greatest thing than mathematics, uh, case in point, I'm a mathematician, so I get excited about the math, right? So like you had Enigma with this amazing math that was put into an electrical mechanical device, and they're like, this is the be all end all. No one will break this tech. It is the thing. 
And what Poland realized is that they had to, and they had to do it by outthinking and outsmarting. And so the Polish Cipher Bureau brought together mathematicians and grand chess masters and puzzle solvers and said, figure out how we outthink this, figure out how we outsmart this, because the consequence, if they couldn't, would have been devastating. A loss of their way of life, their culture, their country, their families, and so they had this impetus to outthink and outsmart their adversary. And I think that's a long reason why the Allies won and we have our freedoms we have today. And so while I would never hope we would get to that point, I will just say in 2030, we don't need a million person cyber army that's well trained. I need the freedom to be able to outthink the adversary instead. And, and to follow on with that, so I think it's absolutely critical that we train on some skills, but it's hard to predict what they are. So it's really important to have that adapting environment that's available all the time, right? And so it's not evolutionary to train a workforce in any industry, but it would be revolutionary to have a persistent environment mm -hmm. that's accessible anytime, any place in the world, that a cyber workforce can go in there and train on whatever the latest skills are. So that environment has to be agile enough to keep pace with the changes because the cyber environment constantly changes, so it'd be hard to say what those skill sets would be. But if you lay out the ecosystem and the infrastructure and make it agile, then you will position yourself to be better prepared for 2030. So I'm going to do what um, panelists often do to moderators that uh, moderators hate, but I'm doing it to myself, which is I'm going to kind of answer the question, but take it in a different direction, which is um, what I'd love to see is we've, you've made great points about the cyber workforce is a reframing of this issue across whole of society, uh, whether it is more traditional cyber skill sets. Um, if we're speaking about a uh, naval surface warfare officer to an army aviator, uh, they will need a particular, they will need an understanding of this battle space to do, do their job effectively. The same thing if we're thinking about the civilian side, um, it is not just the CISO that needs to understand this, the CEO, marketing, and again, whether we're talking about a Fortune 500 company or a mid-sized business, they will be making decisions relevant to cybersecurity. In some situations, they will be making decisions more important than the cyber leader is. But we could also broaden it to, um, I think there's a dire need inside the United States for digital literacy. Uh, not just sort of cyber skill sets, but how do you navigate online, particularly when we think about the way that we are all targeted online. Um, if our kids, but also our baby boomers, who are seven times more likely to spread fake news than any other generation, if they understood um, uh, how to navigate online, they would protect themselves as consumers, they would be better consumers, sure. they would, um, it would have an impact on disease rates when you think about uh, the spread of anti-vaxxers. It would also, they would be better citizens, not only in terms of making um, better decisions relevant to elections, it would also have national security relevance and protecting from foreign uh, government disinformation campaigns. So I'd love to see digital literacy taught and again, it's not just something in schools, it needs to be popping up on social media platforms, you name it. Um, so let's, let's jump to uh, another area. There's been a lot of discussion of um, what's called cyber moonshots. Are there any emerging technologies that you think might totally alter the space in terms of the type of investment we're looking at for these cyber moonshot programs? So in, in some ways, I think we've already made progress towards a cyber moonshot. Uh, our recognition and declaration of the cyber as a war fighting domain and making it equal with air and sea, air and maritime and space and land, uh, I think uh, was our step in the right direction. And it, it led to the stand up of the cyber mission force, mm -hmm. right? But also I think technologies like artificial intelligence and quantum computing, quantum computing would help us in the future. I see artificial intelligence continuing to morph and mature over time. If you look at it from a framework of uh, observe, then decide and act, I think it's already helping us a lot with seeing ourselves, in particular in cyber hygiene, helping us with the observation of the cyber environment. As we go forward over the next 10 years, I can see artificial intelligence helping us with more of the decision making and actions, all right? And so we're looking forward to those type of technologies assisting in the cyber moonshot going forward. 
Uh, in cyber, speed is king, all right? Uh, the speed is kind of what you're looking for in all aspects of cyber. And I think quantum computing, the computational computing power, will allow that particular technologies to help us in all parts of cyber, from developing cyber capabilities to defensive posture to cyber hygiene. It could actually be a game changer and help us move forward uh, towards that particular cyber moonshot. So I cringe a little when I hear the word cyber put against in front of any other word, right? Because we have connotations of what the moonshot was, right? The moonshot was us picking this impossibly hard problem, bringing together the, the smartest minds of the nation and all the resources to bear to prove to the world that we still had it, that we were a technological superpower and we could send a man to the moon. And when's, how long has that been? When's the last time we sent someone to the moon? Like by 2030, I hope we're, we've gone back to the moon, right? But in cyber, that's not gonna work. Like it's not a one shot success, we're good. We can wait 20 years and do it again, right? It has to be a daily continual thing. So I cringe a little on the cyber moonshot. To turn it, uh, the question a little bit, what I care more about is us spending time, resources, wicked smart people and resources to think about another cyber in front of a horrible term, cyber's of, uh, cyber weapons of mass destruction, right? So got it, from a NATO perspective, a weapon of mass destruction would never have cyber, but what does it look like if cyber is overlaid on our current understanding of weapons of mass destruction? And what if by 2030 we're at a point that maybe we were closer to this? I would rather us start thinking today about all the lessons we learned over 30 or 40 years of development of other weapons of mass destruction, how we define them, how we find them, how they're built, how we defend the nation and the globe against it, how we come up to this global consensus of that's just a step too far for anyone. How do we start doing that conversation today in the digital domain before we get to the point where someone actually launches one, right? Because that's what it took the last time, was actually to demonstrate to the world that someone would do that. I want to start the conversation now. Um, so I would prefer to have a conversation in general instead of a cyber moonshot, a cyber so I was, supreme weapon. Yeah, I, I was going to add in um, <laughs> right before I say this, this is a panel that's um, gone so far. And uh, in my mind, you can see why it's a rich discussion, because no one said the word cyber 9-11 or cyber Pearl Harbor <laughs> other than me just making fun of it. Um, that's how you tell the difference between yeah. serious and not serious in this space. I would, I would, I'm not a fan of the moonshot um, conception because it implies a particular destination that you yes. get to, mm -hmm. uh, a victory that you've achieved, and uh, cyberspace is not like that. It's more like a state. And then second, it's not a great parallel because um, of the adversarial nature of it. No one was shooting at the Apollo uh, <laughs> mission and changing tactics as they go. But then finally, um, the real challenge here, and this actually connects to what you brought in, in AI, mm -hmm. is that the adversary is often ourselves. So AI holds the potential to, uh, I agree, change this space, offering up a, a lot of um, ways of kind of tilting the offense-defense balance to the defender's advantage, but it's only so if our AI is information sharing in a smoother way than how we information share right now. AI basically sort of you know lives off of data. The defender AI should be advantaged because they're able to share in a way that attackers aren't. But that's a policy question, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about inside US government or public-private partnerships. So um, let's real quick, last question, uh, one sentence answers. What does the U.S. get most wrong on cybersecurity? So I have to say that um, we array our defensive posture, but we don't have this, the skills and the techniques in place to observe them with enough fidelity to be able to detect when something's wrong or when there's unauthorized activity. It, it takes way too long. Uh, it goes back to uh, me as a young soldier being told that obstacles are only obstacles if they're covered by fire. And a lot of our protective systems don't have any firepower, right? And so we have to move forward. And I think data analytics and artificial intelligence can help us do that. Gotcha. Cyber is not separate. That's where we kind of did not go so smoothly from a military perspective, in my personal opinion. We set cyber up as something separate. It's techie. It's intelligence. Not everybody's good enough to get into it. We started doing cyber for cyber's sake, and that's not right. 
Cyber is just one other component, one other effect that we can put into a commander's kit bag to use to achieve the mission and how he or she chooses to employ it to be able to get to mission success. And so in the future, what we have to understand a lot better is that sometimes cyber, and by that mes uh, message, uh, cyber command might be the main effort and sometimes the supporting effort within the military. And more importantly, as a whole of government, sometimes cyber might be the main effort, but sometimes US Cyber Command and all of its subordinates will be a supporting effort to some other aspect of the whole of government approach. My one sentence is, it took the United States 15 years to come up with a new cybersecurity strategy, and it included nothing about social media influence operations that have proven to be as or a greater threat to the United States. Okay, so let's, on that happy note, um, open it up to questions. Uh, first hand was right here. Wait for Mike, because there's people online. Hi, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Uh, a point you raised, particularly, Colonel, uh, is about the importance of actually being able to bring in outside talent. And you said even maybe for a few weeks rather than for, you know, 20 years. Uh, of course, we just uh, last week had the announcement that the Director of Defense Social Service, Chris Lynch, uh, is leaving. Uh, and, you know, I'm curious what you, you know, you've said about this is important in principle, but, you know, looking at where Defense Digital Service stands and U.S. Digital Service broadly, and other initiatives to sort of shake up, allow more lateral hiring, uh, lateral commissions. Uh, what are the specific things we actually are doing to get that flow back and forth? And what are the things we actually could be doing uh, without just taking a bomb to the entire personnel system, which is awfully tempting? <laughs> Uh, great question. So I can't exactly answer it because I don't know specifically what the United States Army and more importantly DOD is currently doing. I can say from my foxhole, um, what is important is that the military is the largest bureaucracy in the world. Could you imagine an organization of one and a half million people and trying to get the red tape cut to make things work? DDS uh, and its various offshoots have been a tremendous game changer to demonstrate to the world that this is important figuring out how to bring in outsiders in with their skill set and expertise in order to solve specific problems, they've had made great success. And we need to continue to build on this, but not as something separate, right? We need to integrate this into the entire workforce so that it's not just you have to be cool enough for school to make the cut to join the DDS. I want it to be an option for you to come in to the rest of the force also. And so to widen the doors, greater to allow more people the opportunity to come in and not make everyone have to be such a cool cat, which Chris Lynch absolutely is, and it's going to be a darn shame to see him leave. I, I want to crystallize this question for you because you've been on both sides of it. Right. What is one approach that the corporate world has in terms of this that you would like to see brought over into how the military does these assignments? I think in the corporate world, we do allow that maximum flexibility to move in and out of different divisions as well as different corporations and come back. And so as much like what's, what's described there kind of happens on a pretty regular basis. Also understand that in the Army and some of the other services, they are doing some direct commissioning programs. Uh, at, uh, I think in the Army mm -hmm. all the way through the level of 06. Yep. And so to attract the top talent into their services, they still have to work on how they can allow them to do sabbaticals and come in and out and how to have a ready and trained force in the whole of nation that can come to our defenses for a particular mission. And so I think a lot of the ebb and flow in and out of the corporation kind of exists today. Gotcha. Okay. Let's give them another chance. It's right there. Hi there, Brigham Bechtel, Mark Logic. We talked about deterrence, but given our operational security surrounding our cyber capabilities, how do you advertise to an opponent your deterrent capabilities without revealing them in a way that we've been sheltering so far? I think it's a whole of government approach. Just because you have an issue in cyber, you don't have to respond in cyber. We use all the instruments of power, and so how you formulate your particular deterrence plan for that issue just depends on what's the best approach at that particular moment. So I don't think is you have to show how you can deter them in cyber. I think having ready and trained forces, readiness, is, is the biggest deterrent that we can probably demonstrate. Good. 
I would add in um, maybe a core challenge in terms of uh, overall U.S. strategy here is the assumption that a strong cyber offense yields uh, cyber deterrence. Um, there is no doubt among adversary actors that we have a high quality cyber offense capability. Now, there may be some question around the particulars of it, but you know, one of the things that um, uh, your old organizations um, have a lot to be mad at Edward Snowden about, but he did reveal that there is high quality uh, capability there. But that did not yield cyber deterrence, right? Um, and instead, it goes back to actually something that was in the discussion, um, whether it was with the, the CNO or uh, around um, the, the Arctic security. I believe we would gain greater deterrence um, through a resilient structure, or sometimes it's called deterrence by denial. It's where adversaries um, don't just fear retaliation in the same way, you hit me, I hit you directly back the same way, but rather you don't hit me because you know it's not going to work. Um, I will shake it off, I will bounce back quickly. We as a nation do not have very good resilience when it comes to um, uh, overall national cybersecurity, but then when you also think about individual networks within corporations or military organizations, uh, resilience is going to be m far more effective to their um, success than whether it's a corporate side, the ability to hack back, or whether it's military side, the ability to um, uh, hit an adversary back. It's making sure that the, the network itself is resilient. Um, let's get time, we've got time for a couple more. Uh, so anyone else? Yeah, back there in the corner. Um, I'm curious to know your thoughts on um, as the industrial leaders have changed from in World War II manufacturing into information systems like Facebook and Google, um, how can we first prevent, how can we leverage control as a, as a government over those industries if we enter into a major near-peer conflict like we did during World War II and maybe even turn those attack vectors into um, offensive opportunities? So I don't think as a government we need to control industry, nor specifically those industries or any other industries. I think the key is, is that if we're concerned about what the next war is going to look like and we're operating in that gray space, uh, it's resiliency. So in the terms of my generation deterrence uh, by, by resiliency, in the words of Chubb Thumpawamba, I get knocked down, but I get up again. And that's where we need to be. I'll give you the millennial version, Taylor Swift, shake it off. There we go. <laughs> Done. We've spoken to the masses. That's where we need to be from a cybersecurity perspective. If we can get industry resilient, if we can get that critical infrastructure and key resources resilient against any kind of attack, cyber, digital, information, um, operations, any of that, that's going to make a stronger posture for all of us and better uh, defend the nation and protect our way of life from any adversary out there. Yeah, I have to agree. It's not about control. It's really about those partnerships all the time, not just when there's a particular attack. You have to build those relationships every day and in that resilient structure. Thank you. Jim Mutter. I'm a retired Marine, and I'm afraid of uh, cyber. <laughs> well, Reason never free. <laughs> why? Um, I think uh, it's inevitable that the resiliency uh, that's required corporate-wide uh, is going to happen. Uh, they all have security people. They're going to have to have sharp uh, cyber people. And Another thought I had with that regard was since uh, cyber is going to be so per persuasive, pervasive, excuse me, why couldn't uh, there be an organization like the FBI that had regional responsibilities uh, in the here? And there's where you could pluck off your people for a three-week break or whatever it is that you needed, uh, and they would be forced to stay up to. So I'm going to frame that around. Um, is there a need for missing organizations 
whether it's um, there's been proposed the idea of creating a department of cybersecurity. Um, what what is there an organization that's missing here? I'm not sure I would say from my point of view that there's an organization missing. I'm going to say we do a really crappy job of communicating and collaborating right now across the whole of government, and more importantly than communicating with industry. And I think if we could fix that, we don't need to include a craft any more new organizations or anything else, but it's this ability to actually communicate and collaborate, uh, I think, would set us up for success. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we have enough organization is really the sharing and situation understanding. Uh, I do like the concept of creating a civilian cybersecurity type component, ensure that throughout all of our society, from national government to the everyday citizen, that um, cybersecurity is on the forefront. But from a government perspective, I don't see any new organizations that are required. We just have to better optimize the ones that we have. So my response to this is I don't think we need an entire new cabinet department. I think cyber uh, issues connect through so many other areas that it wouldn't make sense. We do, however, um, need to restore uh, at least the position that happened uh, that was within the National Security Council that's been taken away. It's really odd to downgrade cybersecurity at this time. Actually, in my mind, it should have been elevated. Um, second, I think there's a need for potential um, traditional cybersecurity organizations like uh, information sharing ISACs that we have for uh, cyber threats like APTs, where intelligence community, law enforcement, and private sector can share information about threats in a kind of non-public way. We have that for APTs from China or Iran. We don't have that mechanism for disinformation campaigns, uh, whether it's from Russia or something else. Um, and then finally, uh, I think there's a need for a, some, a, some kind of parallel to the National Traffic um, Safety Board, which is a um, after there is an air accident, uh, in a non-liability framework, investigators come in, try and figure out what happened, and share information as rapidly as possible. You can still have lawsuits afterwards, but you have that kind of immediate aspect. We don't have a neat parallel to that in cybersecurity, and I think there's some utility for that. Um, so that uh, hits our, we have the, the red flashing light. Um, this has been, in my mind, a really great conversation. We hit everything from, uh, you know, pop music to, um, yeah, to, to uh, emergent cyber threats, quantum, AI, you name it. Uh, so please join me in a round of applause. Thank you.